So it happens to be a, stay, a saying of mine that uh, you don't really understand something until you break it. So we're going to try to break the CFRs and see if we can understand this a little bit better. There's a couple odd situations that can pop up and they can be really, really difficult to answer. The first off that we often hear is as a A&P, you go through all this work, you spend your time in school and the question comes up, can my certificate expire? Which is a great question. Right? Can you lose your certificate after a period of time passes by? Well, we can try to figure this out by looking at the CFRs. So let's pop this up. We'll take a look at our handy dandy FAR AMT. And let's hop over to part 65 where we talk about certification. So we come down to the mechanics section, subpart D. Here we are. And we have 65 part 83 recent experience requirements. Now, this is a general answer right off the top. Your certificate does not expire. First of all, there's a big difference about that. And, and also there's a bit of terminology that gets used different times. Uh, if you show your certificate to a FAA representative as opposed to surrendering your certificate. Surrendering would imply that you were giving it up. Now you could have your uh, certificate revoked, it could be suspended, but it does not expire. However, a workaround that the FAA has for this is that you cannot exercise the privileges of your certificate, and that's the key that we were right here, a certificated mechanic, that means you already have your license, may not exercise the privileges of your certificate and rating unless within the preceding 24 months you meet these conditions. The administrator has found you're able to do that work, or for at least six months you've served as a mechanic under that rating, technically supervised other mechanics, supervised in an executive capacity, the maintenance and alteration of aircraft, or been engaged in any combination of what we see in one, two, and three. The short answer to that is, if you go more than two years without using your license, let's say you graduate, you get your license, and uh, boy, someone just really is so proud of you, they give you a a whole bunch of money to go travel the world for two years and you find out that after 24 months you come back and you go oh wait I can't use my license how do I get this back relatively straightforward if you're working in a shop you can get the recent experience requirements by working with another appropriately rated mechanic remember any a and can supervise the work of others so if you serve as a mechanic meaning you're performing maintenance duties and you're being supervised by another mechanic for six months then you can get your uh, privileges of your certificate back. The other option is you could talk to the FISDO, our Flight Standards District Office, and schedule an interview. In most cases, it's similar to what may happen for a recurrent interview with an inspection authorization. You can set up a time with your local FISDO, talk to a representative of the DEER FAA, and they'll give you the information you need to be able to uh, proceed. Namely, they'll ask you some questions, you'll probably go through another oral examination of some variety, and then they can deem you fit to perform that work again. Doesn't happen very often, but it's kind of a weird contingency, and it lets us try to break the rules a little bit and see what actually happens. Another one that we run into quite frequently is with Form 337s. So we can scratch this one off the list. Now let's find about Form 337. Now, what we already know about the Form 337 is when we fill one out, we are performing a major repair or alteration. Now there's something critical that relates back to a topic that we've already talked about, and that is approved data versus acceptable data. And really the aim of this is to find out exactly what is what. That's why we're trying to break it here with Form 337. So as we take a look at our regular Form 337, Nope, not that one. Wow, that was irritating. I love it. So we take a look at our Form 337 over here. This should look pretty familiar by now. A lot of you are getting ready to fill these out for your lab projects. And you'll notice a few boxes we have. Aircraft nationality, that's the tail number. Make, right, Cessna, Piper, whatever it happens to be. Serial number, model, and series, right? If it's a Cessna 175A, Cessna 175A. A series, pretty straightforward. 
Now you may be curious about what this big for FAA use only box is about. We're gonna come back to that in just a minute. But in order to understand what's happening here, when we take a look at our Form 337, we identify what kind of work has been performed. We have our conformity statement, which means whatever work we've accomplished, if you happen to be a certificated mechanic, you're the one who performed the work, you're allowed to do that. That is our conformity. You're saying, I certify the repair alteration made in item five above and described on the reverse have been made in accordance with the requirements of part 43. This is kind of an obvious statement because part 43 applies to every piece of maintenance that we do. So of course, whatever we are signing in a formal document that we're sending to the FAA is going to have conformed to part 43. But what this is, is a liability statement. They want your certificate number and your signature on this form to say that you are testifying to the fact that you have done everything that is detailed on this form 337 in accordance with part 43 that's it or in this case is something that would be acceptable by means of what the man, uh, manufacturer has set forth and we have our approval for return to service that is where our inspection uh, authorized inspector is going to make their signature and say everything looks great this person's awesome i love their work and i approve it to be sent out we go to the flip side. This is our description of work accomplished. Now we're gonna jump over to the instructions for filling out a Form 337 to understand exactly what's going into this box. So let's pop over to our FARS again. We'll go to AC 43.9-1, which is instructions for the uh, Form 337. Now we're gonna jump down a little bit. We're gonna go to 8.8 which is description of work accomplished. Now pay attention to the wording here. Enter a clear, concise, and legible statement describing the work accomplished in item eight on the reverse side of FA form 337. All right, pretty clear. It is important to describe the location of the repair or alteration relative to the aircraft or component. So if you make a repair to a spar that is 49 inches from the wingtip, as it points out here, you should indicate that this was done 49 inches from the wingtip. Now, here's the other key, and this is an important one. If the repair alteration can be concealed by skin or another structure, then an authorized individual should make a pre-closure certification statement. That means if you do something that's going to be covered up by skin afterward, and you're asking for the return to service to come from an inspect uh, authorized inspector, that means they need to have eyes on that repair before you close out that section, and that should be detailed as well. Now, this is the one where we get the catch. The description should refer to all applicable 14 CFR sections and to the FAA approved data used to substantiate the airworthiness of the repair or alteration. This should stick out in your brain because it says approved data. This is specifically talking about the difference between approved versus acceptable data. Remember, approved data is something that the FAA has personally reviewed. A manufacturer's maintenance manual would not be considered approved data because the FAA does not review that. That is something that the manufacturer generates. The FAA considers that to be acceptable data, meaning basically they trust the manufacturer to tell you how to maintain the aircraft. They accept that that data is good for use. However, it does not mean that it has gone through the approval process. This puts us in kind of a weird spot because if you make a repair, right, that's covered under the maintenance manual of a particular aircraft, that's acceptable data. So are we able to just send this form off with the reference to the manual? Technically speaking, no. And that is kind of an issue. That's a weird situation we wind up in. If you do not have approved data substantiating the repair on the back of that Form 337, this big scary block of text on the back, the FAA won't take it back. So what in the world do we do? How can we perform a major repair or alteration without having to go through a personal approval process with the FAA? Well, this is something very, very interesting. We're gonna take a look at the AC4313 under acceptable methods, techniques, and practices. Now, in a lot of cases, we talk about this being used as substantiating that the information we've provided or the methodology we've taken is acceptable to the FAA. It tells us all the ways that we can perform maintenance. And if you haven't noticed this already with the AC system, whatever advisory circular we're looking at is connected to that particular 
14 CFR section. So for instance, we have the 43.13 uh, 1B and 2B, which is pertinent to aircraft alterations, something you may not have realized before. If I go to part 43, section 13, you'll notice that 43.13 is the performance rules for maintenance. It says each person performing maintenance, alteration, or preventative maintenance on an aircraft engine, propeller, or appliance shall use the methods, techniques, and practices prescribed in the current manufacturer's maintenance manual or instructions for continued airworthiness prepared by its manufacturer or, and this is the key one, other methods, techniques, and practices acceptable to the administrator. That's where the key is. They're telling us in this particular section, you should follow the manufacturer's maintenance manual, right? Makes sense. Or their instructions for continued airworthiness. However, it says we can also use methods, techniques, and practices acceptable to the administrator. You're probably wondering, Chris, where are you going with this? 4313 in the 14 CFR section talks directly about maintenance. If you take a look at our advisory circulars, Advisory Circular 4313 1B and 2B details all of the information that is acceptable to the administrator that we can do with basically anything, whether it's working on wood structures, non-metallic structures, metal structures, systems and components. This is everything that they've included. Effectively, 4313 is the rule but the advisory circular 4313 gives us all of the extra detail that they could not practically fit into 14 CFR, if that makes sense. That's why the ACs are numbered the way that they are. Now, if we take a look at our second section, AC 4313-2B, we don't talk about it very often, is about aircraft alteration, right? Why is that cool? Let's go back to the preamble for that advisory circular. Remember, to bring this back, we wanna know what happens if I have a Form 337 I need to fill out and that Form 337 does not have uh, easily accessible approved data to substantiate that repair? Well, here's a hint about what we can do. This AC is for use by mechanics, repair stations, and other certificated entities. This data generally pertains to minor alterations. However, the alteration data herein may be used as approved data for major alterations when the AC chapter page and paragraph are listed in block eight of form 337. And the determination we have to make is that it's appropriate to the product being altered, meaning it has to, if, it, if we're making an alteration to a control surface or to a system in the aircraft, it should be something that specific, specifically talks about that kind of alteration. It should be directly applicable to that kind of alteration, and it should not contradict what the manufacturer puts into their manual. So this gives us a loophole. We can use this advisory circular, believe it or not, as approved data under certain circumstances. How does that work with the Form 337? Let's take a look. We fill out box eight. We fill out everything we need to know about the work performed, and we can include those specifics from an AC to define how we made those alterations. Now, do we get to send it in like this? Not exactly. What then happens is we come back to this mystery FA use only box. So if we have something where we don't have easily accessible approved data, what we can do is contact our local FISDO, that Flight Standards District Office, and seek what we call a field approval. So basically, an inspector will come out from the FISDO. They'll take a look at the work that you've done. They'll review the paperwork with you. You'll show them your basis for using, let's say, the AC4313-2B 43, as your approved data. And if they think that looks great, they will fill out box three, indicating the field approval for this major repair or alteration. After which, you have all that together, you make your copies, send it out to the FA at Oklahoma City, and everybody's happy. So that is the loophole. If you wind up in a situation where you go, I don't know what the data is to support this, I don't have an STC, I don't have any directly applicable approved data, then we can seek that field approval from the FISDO and use other sources that can be considered approved data. Now, does that mean that in all cases, the AC4313 is approved data? No. They give it to us right in the preamble there under the specific circumstance in filling out Block 8 of FA Form 337, we can use it as approved data for a major alteration when it is pertinent to all of this. That's a lot to take in, I know, 
but it's kind of a crazy thing and it works out pretty well. And I think it's kind of cool just personally from the, the standpoint of a standards geek, which you're probably wondering why do you want to be that way? I don't know. It just happens. One day you wake up and you're now a geek for standards. All right. So we've covered the weird circumstances of your certificate not allowing you to use the privileges of it. And we've covered weird circumstances with the Form 337 and got a little more specific about this whole approved versus acceptable data thing. So we're doing pretty well. Now let's talk about another kind of strange set of circumstances that comes up a lot. So let's say I'm in an interesting situation, right? You've become familiar with their type certificates. In a lot of cases, maybe you look at an old type certificate for let's say a continental engine and you'll get some kind of crazy continental part number uh, for the spark plugs, right? But you need to replace the spark plugs. You don't have the continental spark plugs. However, the crusty old mechanic in your shop says, oh, well you can just uh, look up the champion spark plug reference. Right, we have this neat reference here and it tells us all of the information we could possibly want for installing spark plugs on engines, right? So right here we have this uh, Aranka uh, 7cc or let's uh, take the 11ac chief over here and we can install RHM 40e spark plugs in it, right? That's great. Champion says it works. Now the question is how can we legally prove that we're allowed to do that, right? Because that might be a major alteration. Let's check. If we go out to part 43, Appendix A, which details our major repairs and alterations, right? straightforward, we can look at a major alteration for a uh, power plant. Now, we look through here, scan through, okay, okay. Oh, let's see. Uh, installation of accessory, which is not approved. Changes to the engine, re replacing structural parts with parts not supplied by the original manufacturer installation of structural parts other than the type of parts used for the installation. Okay, I don't see anything there. Uh, well, I don't know. I guess we are changing a major component of the engine, so that could get us into a little bit of hot water. Eh, it's a gray area, right? The question is, how are we authorized to change the part, right? Because we have a part, it's listed on the type certificate for what's approved. So theoretically, anything that we change from that type certificate would be a deviation from the certification basis of that engine, right? It's a problem. We need to understand why this is legal. In comes the PMA TSO system, all right? Now this is the part that's kind of crazy. If we scroll down to the bottom of our chart here, You'll notice it says bottom right here, champion spark plug engine applications are approved at the publication date. They are subject to revision by later service bulletins or new additions of this chart. What are they talking about? It says plug listings right here are taken from FAA approved data. Oh, whoa, approved data. Well, that's good. We need approved data. So where's this approved data? Well, enter the PMA system. We take a look through DRS, we can search up PMAs. So let's take a standard spark plug, the RHB32E. That is a standard champion spark plug. Here's what we can find. We can find our PMA for that part number. Any part that a manufacturer makes that is considered an aftermarket part must meet certain standards that then are presented to the FAA and the FAA approves that document the same way they would a type certificate or anything else saying this part is acceptable to use on this type certificated device. In this case, a spark plug that's being used on an engine. They have to approve that, which is why it is approved data. That is the whole point of this PMA system. So if we take a look at the PMA authorization here, if it loads, Hey, there we go. Well, that was going to be a really disappointing reveal if it didn't pop up. We have our PMA right here. So PMA part number, RHB32E. It's a spark plug assembly. Approved replacement for part number. Now, this is cool. They point out exactly what the part number is. And the thing that's neat about DRS is if I'm looking for a PMA replacement for a part that I no longer have, I can search the part number from Continental in the PMA system and see everyone who's made approved parts for that. I'll show you that in just a second. So let's just copy this and get ready to show it off here in a minute. But as we scroll down here, current, that means this PMA is active. It tells us that it's a PMA as opposed to like a TSO or something like that. 
and we get the holder of the PMA Champion Aerospace LLC. Now here's a cool thing, that whole bit they show us on their chart about what spark plugs are approved for what engines, that is detailed right here. So make Continental Motors, all of these following engine models, including the Lycoming engines engine models down here, are all now approved to use that spark plug. So Champion showed them the engineering data, they showed them the test data, they said, okay, here's your PMA. It can be used for all these different things. It is super cool the way that that works. It's all tied up, there's no gray area, and you can prove every single thing that you're doing as a mechanic conforms in some fashion or another because we have all of this traceability. It's pretty stinking cool. So as we pop back here, just so you can see how this works, if, for instance, I search this continental part number, we put a search in there, I can go for document type parts manufacturer approvals, right? I have this spark plug, I need a replacement for it. Let's see what PMAs are out there. And we say apply. Oh, well, there we go. Champion is one that's apply, that is uh, applied and got the permission to replace that particular part. So not a lot of options there, but this works with other part numbers. So when you get yourself into a jam, maybe you can't find the one you're looking for from the manufacturer, yeah, give the PMA system a shot and see if there's something that tells you where it might be available. It's pretty slick. Now, let's talk about another interesting situation that comes up. We've covered a couple here. We're making progress. So, we look at there. We've talked about what happens with PMA parts. Now, let's look at another weird situation. Let's say, for instance, you have an aircraft that has a critical component that is not working. Now, what do I mean by critical component? We'll come back to that in a minute. But effectively, we're going to talk about inoperative equipment, or inop is what we call it for short. Now, this could take the form of a lot of different things, right? Anytime something is broken on an airplane, we end up in kind of a gray area. There are some things that are not critical to flight. For instance, if you have a piece of trim that's broken on the airplane, uh, on the interior, that may not really pose a flight safety issue. So that wouldn't necessarily be a major discrepancy. But what if we have something stranger, like uh, for instance, a instrument doesn't work, right? Let's say in this situation, our attitude indicator, right? Our AI, the attitude indicator is non-functional. Are we able to allow that aircraft to fly? Tough question to answer, but let's find out. If we're talking about an airplane flying through the air, then we're talking about general flight rules. General flight rules are going to be in part 91. Those are our operating rules. We're going to scroll down a little bit down to subpart C, which is equipment, instruments, etc., etc. Now we're going to find out. 91.205, this is a great piece of information to have. Powered civil aircraft with cate standard category U.S. airworthiness certificates instrument and equipment requirements. Wow, that's a lot of words to say, the minimum amount of stuff that needs to be on an airplane. And you'll notice that this is broken into a couple different sections. We have visual flight rules in the day, we have visual flight rules at night, and we have instrument flight rules. All right, so let's take a look. Let's find out if this is a required piece of equipment. Airspeed indicator, altimeter, magnetic direction indicator, tachometer for each engine, oil pressure gauge for each engine using a pressure system, temperature gauge for each liquid cooled engine, oil temperature gauge for each air cooled engine, manifold pressure gauge for each altitude engine, fuel gauge indicating the quantity of fuel in each tank, landing gear position indicator if it has retractable landing gear, eh, small civil airplanes after March 11, 1996 in accordance with part 23 should have a red or white anti-collision light system, and now here's a neat little thing. If there's a failure of the anti-collision light system, it can continue to a location where repairs or replacement can be made. Yeah, that might come in handy useful, or a little bit more useful later on. If the aircraft is operated for hire over water, eh, okay, we have to have approved flotation gear, approved safety belt with metal to metal latching device, and for airplanes after 1978, an approved shoulder harness, so on and so forth. Now, for all of these things, do you see an attitude indicator? We've got airspeed, we've got altimeter, but we have no attitude indicator. So the question is, if we have a inoperative attitude indicator, can the aircraft be dispatched? Yes, with an asterisk. If we have inoperative equipment, then we have to 
pull in 91.213, which is inoperative instruments and equipment. All right. So the brief summary on this kind of lengthy section is if there is a minimum equipment list that exists for that aircraft that's been made in addition to the basic requirements of 91205 and in addition to what we see in the type certificate database uh, or the data sheet that we see, then we have to apply that minimum equipment list. If we don't have the minimum equipment, we can't fly. Uh, if we do not have a minimum equipment list, then it has to be applicable to the section that it's operating in. So part 91, day, night, or instrument flight, right? And we take a look here. This uh, details this for us. The inoperative instruments and equipment are not part of the VFR day type certification instruments and equipment prescribed in the applicable airworthiness regulations under which the aircraft was type certified, indicated as being on the required on the aircraft's equipment list or kinds of operations equipment list for the kind of flight operation being conducted, uh, required by 91205 or any other rule of this part for the specific kind of operation required to be operational by an airworthiness directive. So part three tells us what to do. The inoperative instruments and equipment are removed from the aircraft, the cockpit control placarded, and maintenance recorded in accordance with Part 43.9 of this chapter, or deactivated and placarded inoperative. If deactivation of the inoperative equipment, uh, instrument or equipment involves maintenance, it must be accomplished and recorded in accordance with Part 43 of this chapter. So basically, the short version on this is, we can fly the airplane, however, if it does not work, we must deactivate the equipment and we must put a placard on it, meaning a label, that says inop or inoperative. This is a safety of flight thing. We don't want a malfunctioning uh, aircraft instrument to be giving bad information to the pilot. We want to make it very, very clear that that is not available for active use, right? So pretty straightforward, right? Now... What if we take a look at something else? What if we have something as simple as a light burned out on the wing, right? We have one of our position lights burned out. That seems a lot less serious than, say, an attitude indicator. But let's see what 91205 says. Visual flight rules, we're okay there. What about uh, visual, light, visual flight rules for night? Let's see. Instruments and equipment specified in paragraph B. Okay, we just took a look at that. Approved position lights. Oh, okay. Well, that's a problem. If we don't have a appropriate position light, we could just be missing one light on a wing. We cannot fly at night now. We're fine in the day, but we cannot fly at night. It seems like a small difference and it seems like a small thing, but we have to pay attention to what these minimum equipment requirements are because we can get ourselves into a lot of hot water. The other thing we need to reference when we're looking at this minimum equipment is the aircraft type certificate. I'll show you what we're looking at here. This is the Cessna 175 minimum equipment. Uh, so this is just located in the type certificate data sheet. And you'll notice down here, we have equipment. The basic required equipment is prescribed in the applicable airworthiness requirements must be installed in the aircraft for certification. It must include a current flight manual and so on. In addition, the following items of equipment are required. So in the case of the 175, we have at our hangar, model 175 through 172D, we must have a stall warning indicator installed. That's all the time, constantly. So whether it's day, night, or instrument flying, it has to have a stall warning indicator. If that doesn't work, we cannot fly, all right? Now, let's try to break this a little bit more. So we have inoperative equipment, right? We've talked about our attitude indicator here, but what if we have a required piece of equipment, right? Follow me on this one, a required piece of equipment that doesn't work and we don't have the ability to fix it where we're at. Let's say you're way up in the middle of nowhere in Alaska and you have a piece of equipment that's required for flight that uh, breaks and we don't have the equipment to fix it and we can't get anyone up here to fix it. According to the FAA, at least for as far as we know, the plane must sit there for eternity or until someone can come up and fix it in an appropriate fashion. Except, right? Here's the uh, except, here's the asterisk. Let's go back to the CFRs. I'll show you another neat trick here that gets used quite a bit. We'll go up to part number 21, certification procedures. You may wonder why we're talking about certification procedures, but here we go. So we scroll down a little bit here. We have 
Air within certificates. Ah, 21.197. Special flight permits. Now, this is a nice provision that we have. A special flight permit may be issued for an aircraft that may not currently meet applicable airworthiness requirements, but is capable of safe flight for the following purposes. Number one, flying the aircraft to a base where repairs, alterations, or maintenance are to be performed or to a point of storage. Wow, this is perfect. I have a piece of equipment that doesn't work. I can't fix it where I'm at. I have the ability to apply for a special flight permit to get it to where it needs to go so we can fix it. That's super cool. As long as we can establish that the airplane can fly safely, right? A great example would be that particular light. If for some reason we can't get a position light, right? Well, you could just fly it during the day. But if we have no choice, let's say you're up in Alaska and it's nighttime all the time, then can we get that taken somewhere else? Potentially. We can apply for a special flight permit. And 21.199 talks about that process. Basically, you'll have a, a statement to the FAA. They'll probably talk with an inspector and see what you can figure out for how to make this work. But you're going to include the purpose of the flight, the itinerary, so times, the route being taken, the crew required to operate the aircraft, the ways that the aircraft does not comply with the airworthiness requirements, and any restriction the applicant considers necessary for safe operation and any other information considered necessary by the FAA. We're gonna do it as safely as we can, but they can give you authorization. This is the only situation in which an airplane that, that does not conform with its type certificate right, that, that has something missing or doesn't apply in some fashion, this is the only set of circumstances in which it can legally fly. And you'll see this come back in a few other situations when you get into inspections. In some cases, if you have an aircraft that has reached its time for a 100-hour inspection, there are some provisions that allow you to fly it within a certain amount of hours to an area where that 100-hour inspection can be performed. So there are just some really interesting ways that the FA uh, has the CFRs work when we try to break it and see where the gray areas are. But this should give you a little bit of confidence that all of these things can, f you can find answers for them. It's just a matter of looking in the right places and doing enough research. It helps when all the paperwork is good, but there's always an answer. So if you get an area where you can't figure out what to do, you can't figure out what the correct answer is, don't fret, don't give up hope and just say, well, well, we'll go with my best guess. Keep digging because there is an answer. Ask someone who's been dealing with this more often than you have. Ask your inspector. Ask a mechanic that's been doing this for a long time. Have them show you where in the CFRs it gives you the permission to do something. And that's really an important thing as we get further along to getting you to be a certificated mechanic is don't just rely on knowledge from what people have told you. If they're gonna give you information, then ask them to show you where you can substantiate that information. Because again, everything that you do, that is gonna ride on your license. So dig in, go on some of these weird adventures and CFRs and see what you can find to get these answers. Hope this helps out and I hope it makes things a little bit more clear. I think it's a little bit fun to try to break things and uh, see what happens. So I hope you understand how this works a little bit better now.